This is a brief video on assorted thyroid diseases. We're going to be talking about diseases that cause hypothyroidism, those that cause hyperthyroidism, and some diseases that cause inflammation of the thyroid called thyroiditis. Now, I broke down the list of diseases on the left here into those that cause hypothyroidism, those that cause hyper, and the thyroiditis that kind of cause hypo, might start with hyper, end in hypo, sometimes cause both, sometimes cause neither, so which put them in a the middle category there. We have a lot to get through. Let's get started. Start with a brief description of hypothyroidism. It's when the thyroid gland does not produce enough thyroid hormone. The epidemiology here is that it's more common in women and it's more common as you get older. Symptoms here, and it's important to contrast these from hyperthyroidism, somebody with hypothyroid might have fatigue, cold intolerance, impaired memory and concentration, constipation, weight gain despite poor appetite, which is unusual, shortness of breath, hoarseness, dry skin, myxedema, periorbital swelling, and carpal tunnel. We also show increased diastolic pressure, and this is because the thyroid hormone usually activates beta receptors in the peripheral vasculature, and those beta receptors usually vasodilate the peripheral vasculature. So because you are not vasodilating, you're vasoconstricting, so your heart's pumping against closed vasculature, you're going to have decreased pulse pressure and increased diastolic pressure. And because you have low T3 and T4, you're going to have higher deposition of gly uh, glycoaminoglycans, which are usually reuptaken and usually turned over by uh, increased basal metabolic rate, increased T3 activity. So because you have less thyroid hormone, you're going to have accumulation of these GAGs. And if hypothyroidism is not treated, it can, pro it can progress to myxedema coma which is a state characterized by bradycardia, hypotension, hypothermia, hypoventilation, stupor, and coma. It could lead to death. This is usually related to other chronic illnesses and uh, people who have been diagnosed with hypothyroidism but have been non-compliant with their medications. Treatment here is to find the underlying cause and to administer thyroid hormone. So another cause of congenital hypothyroidism. This is also known as cretinism. That term has fallen out of favor because it's a little offensive to call people cretins. Uh, these are people who have underdeveloped or absent thyroids due to a variety of causes, such as a defect in thyroid hormone synthesis, often thyroid peroxidase. It could also be due to thyroid agenesis. It can be due to maternal hypothyroidism during pregnancy or iodine deficiency. Epidemiology is one of about 3,000 more female than men, and uh, there's symptoms that include poor brain development, pale skin, protruding tongues, protruding umbilicus, pot-bellied abdomen, and a puffy face. You can remember these symptoms with the P's. Um, and there's a characteristic image of what somebody with congenital hypothyroidism might look like. They're shorter, they haven't grown as much, poor brain development, pale, protruding umbilicus, pot-bellied, puffy face. That's cretinism. Next, we have assorted cases of hypothyroidism that, that don't really fit with that. Um, it could be caused by hypopituitarism, which would be called just which would be called a secondary hypothyroidism. Some medications can cause hypothyroidism, like lithium and amiodarone. Amiodarone specifically has a lot of iodines. This is a medication that's used for cardiac arrhythmias. And if you have excess iodine uh, production, the body physiologically decreases hormone production. This is called the wolf chaikoff effect, where the body detects that you have excess iodine and downregulates thyroid peroxidase in response to that excess iodine, in this case, in the form of amiodarone. Iodine deficiency can also cause hypothyroidism. This is really common in uh, the United States, but it is common in some iodine deficient parts of the world. Post surgeries can also cause hypothyroidism. So you have a surgery around your neck, the, uh, the surgeon nicks some of your thyroid, it could cause you to go into a hypothyroid state, and also radiation might do the same. Radiation damage to your thyroid can cause it to be underactive. The first of the thyroiditis that we're going to talk about is called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. This is the most common cause of hypothyroidism, um, so it's kind of closer to hypothyroidism on that list on the left.
So this is also known as autoimmune primary hypothyroidism, and that tells you the etiology of the disease as well. Also called chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, and we'll see it, an image of histology, and, and you'll know why it's called chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. This is the most common cause, as I said earlier, of hypothyroidism in the U.S., uh, where iodine deficiency is not an issue. It's autoimmune in origin. There's uh, antithyroid antibodies that particularly are against thyroid peroxidase enzyme. And what's interesting about this disease is that it initially presents as a hyperthyroid state. The antibody comes in, causes the follicles to rupture and to dump all of the thyroid hormone that they had been making. So initially it's a hyperthyroid state, but eventually the antibody and the surrounding inflammation prevent hormone synthesis. They bind to the TPO, the thyroid peroxidase enzyme, and prevent the thyroid from making new hormones. So it starts off as hyperthyroid and then it's hypothyroid. Grossly, the thyroid is firm, non-tender, and enlarged. Um, that's usually pretty noticeable on palpitation. And on histology, we see herthal cells here, which are epithelial cells with pink changes to the epithelium um, through a process called oncocytic metaplasia. We also see lymphoid aggregates, which are mixtures of large and small cells with germinal centers. Um, and these germinal centers can help you think that there's chronic inflammation going on. So chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, again, makes sense here. This is typically a permanent disease. It's associated with the HLA-DR5 protein, and uh, that's that's kind of what, what mediates the autoimmune response in this case. Patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis also have an increased risk of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, often arising from B cells in the marginal zone. Um, that's an important association to know. So here's an image of histology for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. We uh, kind of see that oncocytic metaplasia here. You see a lot more blue, a lot more blue-purple than you would normally see on a histology side. You can even see some germinal centers starting to form. Here's, a, here's what looks like a germinal center of lymphocytes. Um, so you know that there's chronic inflammation going on. You do see some normal thyroid follicles here and around here, but um, mostly it's surrounded by inflammation. And it, it, it would make sense that the thyroid is less functional in this state. Next, we have subacute thyroiditis, another case of thyroid inflammation. This one's also called granulomatous thyroiditis, or also de Quervain's thyroiditis. It can present with initial hyperthyroidism again. Oftentimes, though, this one does not dip down into hypothyroidism. Um, it usually stays euthyroid after that initial hyperthyroid spike. This disease often follows a viral infection. Clinically, this one is distinct in that the thyroid is painful. It's very tender, um, especially pain that radiates to the jaw. And uh, we do see increased erythrocyte sedimentation rates with this disease as well. So think painful, think increased ESR. Grossly, the thyroid is asymmetrically enlarged. It's, uh, it's fibrotic and it's very tender on exam. Tender and painful on exam. Those are the key words. On histology, we see acute infiltrates. We see granulomas. Formations. We see follicles that are replaced with histiocytes and the multinucleated giant cells that are characteristic of granulomas. We also might see fibrosis, so we're going to see an image of that soon. You can treat these with NSAIDs and prednisone, mostly because of the pain that's associated with subacute thyroiditis. So there you go. That's a granuloma uh, that's characteristic of granulomatous thyroiditis. Pretty characteristic. Painful, uh, radius to the neck. You can treat it with NSAIDs or prednisone. Subacute thyroiditis. Next is fibrous thyroiditis. This one's a little more rare, also called Rydell's thyroiditis. Uh, it's more rare. Patients are usually in their 30s or older. Uh, more, normal thyroid tissue here is replaced by dense fibrosis, and that's kind of reflected clinically where the thyroid is as hard as a rock. It can be described as a stone. It's fixed in place or fixed to a nearby structure, um, sometimes so hard that it's causing compressive symptoms to the other vital structures in your neck. Uh, about a third of cases here cause hypothyroidism, a third or two thirds do not. This is an IgG4 related disease, which is a systemic group of diseases associated with infiltration by that particular antibody, IgG4, um, that secretes plasma cells. Next, we're going to talk about hyperthyroidism. This is just going to be an overview of the symptoms and what you get associated with hyperthyroidism before we jump into some examples. So hyperthyroidism, as you might expect, uh, means excess thyroid hormone. Epidemiology here is a prevalence of about 1% to 2%. 
amongst the population. It can be from an endogenous source or an exogenous source. So your body can be making too much thyroid hormone itself, or you could be taking too many thyroid supplements that uh, cause you to have the same symptoms. And these symptoms are listed here. Again, it might be helpful to read these symptoms after looking at the hypothyroid symptoms and notice how they're kind of contrasting. Hyperthyroidism has diarrhea or hyperdefecation, whereas hypothyroidism has constipation. This one has palpitations, high heart rate, whereas hypothyroidism has a lower heart rate. This one has wet, moist skin and sweating, whereas hypothyroidism has dry skin. So they, they really do contrast. And oftentimes, diagnosing hypo versus hyperthyroidism is not the issue. It's finding the cause of the thyroid disorders. So anyway, symptoms of hyperthyroidism include nervousness, irritability, perspiration, palpitations, hand tremors, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, increased appetite, and weight loss despite increased appetite, which is pretty unusual, hyperdefecation, malabsorption as a result of hyperdefecation and your bowels just moving faster, thinning of skin, brittle hair, upper and lower muscle extremity, and a stare or lid retraction in the eyes that make your eyes look huge and like they're popping out of your head. There's increased pulse pressure in this case. Uh, these diseases are, or these symptoms are due to accelerated net metabolism and hyperfunctioning of organs. Hyperthyroidism can progress to thyroid storm. It's kind of like the opposite of myxedema coma. It's when you have hyperthyroidism that has not been treated. And that is characterized by fever, mental status changes, and cardiovascular collapse. Thyroid storm is related to other diseases, oftentimes, and sometimes related to surgery and sepsis. Um, a lot of times it's patients that have not complied with their antithyroid medications, they end up in a state of thyroid storm. Treatment here is high dose PTU, which is an antithyroid medication. And then later you do want to give beta blockers and a, a glucocorticoid dexamethasone. Um, you also want to find out the underlying cause of the hyperthyroidism and address that as well. So Graves' disease, most common cause of hyper thyroidism. Start with that one. Epidemiology is at about 70% of cases of hyperthyroidism. Women are more than five times more likely than men to uh, get Graves' disease. It's autoimmune in origin. And here, the TH TSH receptor on the thyroid cells is erroneously activated by thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins. So your immune system is making antibodies that act as TSH, that stimulate thyroid cells to produce thyroid hormone. This is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction uh, where IgG autoantibodies are used to stimulate the TSH receptor. There's also increased cytokines because this is an inflammatory state. Um, and these cytokines, uh, one of their side effects is to stimulate the fibroblasts to secrete gags. So again, we see gags in Graves' disease like we saw in hypothyroidism. Um, these gags then cause muscle swelling and inflammation, and uh, they can cause adipocyte to become pretty active. Some additional symptoms that are uh, unique to Graves' disease is Graves' ophthalmopathy and Graves' dermopathy. And this is because the antibodies that stimulate the TSH receptor also have an effect behind the eye and behind the skin in front of the shins, in front of the tibial bones, the, the tibial muscle. So they kind of form aggregations there and what's called uh, pretibial muscle and fibroblasts. So you, your eyes pop out because you have retroorbital antibodies and you have a mass on your shins because you have antibodies in the pretibial muscle there as well. Clinical symptoms here, or clinical signs here is that you see a symmetric enlarged and non-tender thyroid. Sometimes you might even hear a thyroid brewy or a thrill. And grossly, in Graves' disease, the thyroid is large, and it's dark red. It's beefy looking, and it's hyperplastic. On histology, you see that colloid has been depleted, and you often see white spaces surrounding the, the colloid. This is called a scalloped follicle, very characteristic um, on histology, and it's a, it's a good point to know. You also see more lymphocytes here. To treat here, you use either methamizol. I think I should redo this one. The treatment here is either methamazole 
or propothiouracil, often called PTU. Those are both antithyroid drugs. Here's a histology image of Graves' disease. You can see the characteristic scalloped appearance here, where the colloid is kind of retracted into the follicles. It's been scalloped. It's been pulled away, and those white spaces remain. That is the scalloped follicle appearance for Graves' disease. Another cause of hyperthyroidism is toxic multinodular goiter. This is about 20% of all hyperthyroidism cases. Females more common than men, and this usually happens in older patients. This is when thyroid growth gradually occurs. Um, it often happens in nodules or little, little bundles. And uh, it's important to know that these nodules have monoclonal expansion. Um, so, it's, so it's usually kind of kind of like a tumor that, that grows a little bit too much, um, but it's not cancerous, but it does not spread. These are often growing independently of TSH. Um, so your pituitary downregulating the amount of TSH that it pumps out does not make a difference. Clinically here, we see an asymmetric gland, which helps you to differentiate it from Graves' disease. You also see a nodular appearance. You might see bumps, nodules that have all grown independently and gradually. The cause here is a variety of etiologies. There are growth factors involved. Goitrogens, which are chemicals that are chemicals and molecules that might cause goiter, um, are often at play, and genetics has uh, a big part in the etiology as well. You might want to differentiate toxic multinodular goiter from toxic adenoma, which is a uninodular uh, thyroid where one nodule gets big. Um, there are same symptoms between them. Big difference is that the toxic adenoma, the uninodular adenoma, is, as I said, a single nodule, a single hot nodule, because um, hot, hot nodule means that it produces thyroid hormone, whereas a cold nodule does not. Um, and toxic multinodular goiter is, of course, many hot nodules because it causes hyperthyroidism, whereas toxic adenoma is a single large uninodular disease. And like all hot nodules, it's important to note that both toxic adenoma and toxic multinodular goiter, because they are toxic, because they are hot nodules that produce thyroid hormone, are rarely malignant. Thyroid cancers are usually cold nodules. To treat toxic multinodular goiter, first line is often radioactive iodine. Uh, the large nodules that you have in the neck might require surgical resection as well. Lastly, we're going to talk about the jode based off phenomenon which is when a person who was previously iodine deficient, such as coming from a developing part of the world that is low iodine, uh, is given an increase in iodine in their diet. And the body's response is to kind of hoard all of that iodine and start pumping out a bunch of thyroid hormone. So this jode based off phenomenon is a cause of hyperthyroidism. And it's, uh, it's kind of like a like physiologic mechanism gone wrong. When somebody comes from an iodine deficient area, goes to a place, gets iodine, gets sufficient iodine, either in their diet or uh, from amiodarone or from iodine containing contrast agents, and their body starts to produce massive amounts of thyroid hormone. You can kind of think of it as the opposite of the wolf checkoff effect that we mentioned earlier. And uh, again, as I said, this is pathological. This is uh, this. It's a physiologic effect that has turned pathological because that person is now in a high thyroid state. So that's it for this overview of thyroid diseases. I hope it was helpful and thank you for listening.